As a brand new doctor in an acute situation, you may well be the first person to look at the arterial blood gas as it might be you who is tasked to take the blood and run it through the gas analyzer. So here's a tutorial that's going to give you something useful to say when you run back up to the ward wondering what all the partial pressures mean and how it translates to patient care. By the end of the tutorial, you will hopefully understand the two types of respiratory failure and you should be able to come up with a good list of differential diagnoses for each. The normal values for the arterial partial pressures of oxygen and carbon dioxide are displayed here. Hypoxemia can be defined as a PaO2 less than 10.6 kilopascals and hypercapnia as a PaCO2 greater than 6 kilopascals. Respiratory failure, however, can be defined as a PaO2 less than 8 kilopascals. And as you will see, since CO2 is dependent on ventilation, a CO2 greater than 6.7 kilopascals may also define respiratory failure. Now, you don't need to take off a patient's oxygen mask when you want to check the arterial gases. This can be very dangerous. There exist rules of thumb relating the expected arterial partial pressure of oxygen, the PaO2, to the amount of inspired oxygen, but since this is all a bit sketchy, all I will say is to at least use some common sense. As an extreme example, a patient breathing 15 litres per minute of oxygen through a non-rebreathe mask is really not well if his or her PaO2 is only 10. Respiratory failure can be acute or chronic or indeed acute on chronic. Importantly, respiratory failure can also be classed as type one or type two. A type one respiratory failure is one where there is a low or normal CO2, and in a type two respiratory failure, the CO2 is raised. But why do we need to know this? Is it of any practical use? Of course it is. If we can define which type of respiratory failure our patient has, then we can narrow down the causes. And anyway, all you have so far is a few notes to memorize, what you really need is a tour of the respiratory system so that these definitions are understood and retained. The respiratory system can be separated into the gas exchange interface and the respiratory apparatus, which is very convenient as they each relate directly to the two types of respiratory failure. First, let's take a look at type 1 respiratory failure and the gas exchange interface. During gas exchange in the alveoli, oxygen passes through the type 1 pneumocyte some basement membrane, the endothelial cell of the capillary, and carbon dioxide passes the other way. CO2 is about 20 times more soluble than oxygen, making it much more readily exchanged across this interface. So that's why, if there is any problem with this gas exchange interface, then the PaCO2 may be normal while the PaO2 decreases, or the arterial CO2 may even be low as the patient hyperventilates. So, causes of a type 1 respiratory failure are either conditions that cause a right-to-left cardiac shunt, so deoxygenated blood effectively bypassing the gas exchange interface altogether, and conditions that cause a ventilation-perfusion mismatch, also known as VQ mismatch. Now, this mismatch can occur in two ways. Firstly, it may occur when alveoli have an adequate supply of blood for gas exchange, but not much air getting into these alveoli. A few examples of this include acute asthma, pulmonary edema, adult respiratory distress syndrome, pneumonia, pneumothorax, and fibrosing alveolitis, to name but a few. Secondly, the mismatch can occur when alveoli are adequately ventilated but are not perfused properly, for example, in a pulmonary embolism. Now let's talk about type 2 respiratory failure and the respiratory apparatus. The respiratory apparatus is what is necessary for ventilation, which is essentially the process of shifting air in and out of your lungs. If you're in a stuffy room, for example, you open the windows to increase ventilation in order to move air in and out of the room. In an actual person, ventilation is dependent on the rate and depth of breathing. So the greater the tidal volume and or respiratory rate, the greater the ventilation. So what controls ventilation? Well, CO2 dissolves in the cerebrospinal fluid, the CSF, and the concentration of hydrogen ions in the spiritual center of the medulla oblongata in the brainstem causes an increase in the rate and depth of breathing. So CO2 is generally the key, although the exception would be the hypoxic drive in some patients who chronically retain CO2, namely some patients with chronic COPD, in which case their respiration may be dependent on the oxygen concentration and not the CO2. 
So that aside, the CO2 effectively causes a propagation of action potentials from the brainstem down the neurons of the spinal cord, from motor neurons at the neuromuscular junction to the muscles of respiration, and these then move a hopefully intact chest wall to cause air to be sucked in and blown out of the lungs, which is aided, of course, by the elasticity of the lungs themselves. If there is a failure of ventilation, there is a problem with at least one of these steps. This would cause the arterial oxygen to drop and the arterial CO2 to build up as the patient is simply not shifting enough air in and out of the lungs for them to perform their normal function of gas exchange. So use this list to come up with some differential diagnoses for type 2 respiratory failure. For example, a stroke or drugs such as opiates or benzodiazepines may adversely affect the respiratory centre of the brainstem. Trauma to the spinal cord. Neurological conditions affecting the nerves supplying the muscles of respiration, such as Guillain-Barre syndrome. Then there's myasthenia gravis, which affects the neuromuscular junction. Motor neuron disease can affect muscles, and a flail segment can adversely affect the mechanics of chest wall movement and ventilation. If you like, you could pause the video and see what other differential diagnoses you can come up with using this framework. How do you remember type 1 from type 2 respiratory failure? Well, type 1 can progress to type 2, also known as a mixed respiratory failure. If someone is breathing so heavily in order to try to correct their type 1 respiratory failure, they may become so tired that they fail ventilation as well as having the original ventilation perfusion mismatch that got them into this situation. An example of this is severe acute asthma, and it is a bad sign, and this patient needs help very quickly. This type 1 to type 2 progression may help you remember which one is which. In summary, respiratory failure can be defined as an arterial oxygen pressure of less than 8 kilopascals or an arterial CO2 greater than 6.7 kilopascals in a patient breathing room air. Type 1 respiratory failure indicates a right to left shunt or a ventilation perfusion mismatch and will result in hypoxia with a low or normal CO2. Type 2 respiratory failure indicates a problem with one or more areas of the respiratory apparatus causing hypoventilation and will result in hypoxia with a high CO2. If you understand the concepts behind the numbers, you should be able to make a reasonable list of differential diagnoses. Finally, if a patient develops a type 2 respiratory failure from a type 1 respiratory failure, then this may be a sign that your patient is getting very tired and it's a really bad sign. So that's respiratory failure in a nutshell. Do leave some feedback and comment below if you have any questions. Thanks for watching. Bye bye.